everybody's fantastic today because we have Kevin Kenson here. Wow. How are you, Kevin? I'm good, Bob. How are you? I'm fantastic. Everything's going great so far. Had a bit of a productive day. I'm, I'm, I've got good. the high of productivity after waking up at three o'clock in the afternoon. You know how it is. Anyway. Uh, I don't actually what? <laughs> <laughs> Edward, thank you for the host. Ripple Rip, thank you for the two months. Great job. Keep it going. Thanks, dude. And underscore, thanks for the 38 months. Turn this off, Bob. Yeah, I forgot. I'm sorry that I left the notifications on. They're off now. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is episode 17 of the Wolf Den Podcast. We have Kevin here today. Uh, we got a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of relevant news for the both of us. But first, I want to talk about you, Mr. Kenson. How is, I, I, I have to, that's not your real name, Kevin Kenson. There's no way. It is. I, 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 I need the receipts, dude. <laughs> gonna, uh, I'm going to look you up like, in the California well, registry. Yeah, the it's somewhere a, in this room. I'm a birther <laughs> now. I'm, I'm forcing you to, to, to show your documents. Anyway, so I want to know, you have a weird sort of history on YouTube like how you got started you kind of just fell right into it yeah um so i mean am i just gonna walk it back right now we just yeah. can do the full origin story. yeah, yeah. Uh, i know it nobody else knows it yeah a few people know it uh so i was originally on another channel way back in it was probably like 2010 like end of 2010 I started showing up on a channel called uh tld today which is still around but it doesn't go by that name anymore it's now just jonathan morrison uh, so I did gaming coverage on that channel because back then when they first started the channel and it was doing really well, they had a lot of people asking like, oh, are we going to do games coverage? Because YouTube was the Wild West back then. We didn't know what anyone was doing, right? So after a lot of people asked that, John was like, I don't know shit about games. Uh, Kevin does. And so they asked, uh, he and my brother who were working together at the time, well, and still work together, uh, asked if I wanted to start doing that stuff for them, and I said yes. So I was doing that part-time with them for a few years, and then around 2014 is when I started my own channel, still working with them, but just having my own channel that I focused on, and uh, I've been growing it since then. So so, so you, did, uh, you did games on their channel first, and then you kind of spun off into your own channel. Yeah, right, exactly. I wasn't I was trying to do more like actual games coverage back then because that's like really what got me started like wanting to do videos. So I was doing more game reviews uh, to try and tie in a little better with like the overall channel's theme. I would also do stuff like best app games of the month, that kind of deal. Uh, but it wasn't until later that I really started leaning much more into like accessories, hardware and kind of more the I'd say my channel right now is really more gaming stuff than it is gaming. That I, makes sense. I feel that. I feel that, yeah. a lot. I feel that a lot. It it's just what works. We we kind of uh like came about around the same time. We kind of both came up came about when the switch was going on. That's like where we like hit our strides. Um and that for whatever reason the hardware stuff just stuck for the both of us. That's just what ended up doing well on YouTube. So that's kind of like where what we had to lean towards. Yeah, well, and there's a lot less people doing it back then, too. You know, I feel like there's quite a few channels now that, like, try to do that avenue. But back in 2017, like, there really wasn't a lot of channels focused on that. There's review channels for days when it comes to games. But for accessories, there really wasn't that much yet. Yeah, it's like it's like there were gaming channels and there were tech channels. But it was hard to find one that was both. Besides, like, you know, like Linus Tech Tips, which is, like, allowed to do whatever they want. <laughs> Yeah, but definitely with like a PC focus still too, right? Like console is relatively untouched aside from maybe like some retro focus channels. Exactly. Yeah, I've always been, well, I don't want to say always been a console person. There was like a brief moment in my life where uh, I was poor. So I used to just download games on my computer. <laughs> so like, and also around that time, there was like no, like console gaming didn't really figure out controls for shooters yet. There was like a weird time in like the PS2 era when like, controls just control schemes just weren't good um, oh yeah i forgot how resident evil 4 played until i started up on the ps2 i'm like oh right this was tank controls <laughs> like you can only aim while standing in place feet planted on the ground and now the stick does that instead okay that makes sense yeah so <laughs> i remember thinking that was like revolutionary back then 
I mean, it was there. I mean, there weren't. There were very few games back in that era that like felt good. <laughs> so like, uh, that's I played a lot of games on PC around that time because uh, that was just easier. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, I've always no. Since then, I've been super hard into consoles because I just like the luxury of having a console and I, I like to have all my games in one spot. So uh, personally, I feel the market for some sort of uh, tech related, you know, information about specifically consoles because that's the niche that I live in really. Exactly. And that's kind of what I fell into too, especially because right before the Switch came out, my videos that started really taking off well consistently were doing like you know, PS4, or back then, PS3 versus Xbox 360, then PS4 versus Xbox One, and then Switch came out, did unboxings, did a couple accessory reviews, and like, oh, these videos are blowing up. Like, my most vid viewed video to this day is, like, the second Switch accessory video I did. It's ridiculous. I think, uh, yeah, the, all the early Switch stuff is still some of my most viewed stuff on, on my channel, too. For, for, for you, it makes, it, it makes a little bit of sense, because you came from a tech channel already. So spinning off yeah. into another, you know, tech focused channel that's mostly focused on, you know, consumer console games, uh, consoles is that makes sense to me. Yeah. Which is funny because I don't know anything about regular tech. Like people always randomly ask me like, <laughs> oh, like, what do you recommend for these phones? I'm like, I don't know. I can tell you about <laughs> Xbox. Like, uh... <laughs> I actually just had somebody ask me about, uh, uh, PC components today. And I was like, you know, like. Five years ago, I might have been able to answer you, but now I, I'm just so out of it. Yeah, I, I I understand enough, but not an expert. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 so far out of that now. It, like, I mean, I have a hackintosh, so like, I'm in like a completely other world when it comes to like building computer components. I have to get. I've been. I have this one tab open on my. So when I open up Chrome, three tabs open: Tweet Deck youtube and this which is now in stock for this one specific graphics card because if i if you have a hackintosh only a few graphics cards work on mac and this is just never in stock because i guess it's an old graphics card so that's my struggle so so how have your playstation 5 and xbox videos been doing it's weird right so I will say, like, when the systems were releasing, that stuff was definitely, like, at its peak. Uh, especially because I did end up getting a chance to use an Xbox early. They sent me, like, a preview unit kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So that helped a lot. Those yeah, that was... I remember that. Cool. That was crazy. Yeah, that stuff was great. PlayStation, I had to wait till launch day because uh, I just grabbed one. Uh, but those ones did still pretty well. I, I got to say, like, in general, 2020 definitely messed with views in general. Like, I feel like my entire concept of, like, what's a good hitting video right now has shifted a bit. Because something about that year between changing how we work and upload schedule and all that kind of stuff, like, the YouTube algorithm definitely got confused about me. <laughs> <laughs> Which, not in the way that I want it to be. <laughs> so, I, I yeah, feel so like a lot of people are saying that. A lot of people are saying that the last year or so the algorithm just did some weird stuff and people are in weird places right now changed and people are still figuring it out because there's a lot of channels i know that are doing the same as they were before or even better in a few cases like i feel like uh spawn waves channels been doing great the last like year yeah um, his has I mean, and, he, and he does daily yeah. videos so like uh and they always do they always hit good numbers yeah they hit consistently yeah and then but I know a bunch of people, myself included, where it's just like, oh, this is different now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the algorithm favor favors daily stuff. It did for I a long not, time. Like, yeah. If, imagine, imagine you doing daily videos. <laughs> I would hate that. I would With hate the that production that. value that you got, that would be a nightmare. We have some that we rush up quick, but yeah, doing that like every single day, no. Yeah. No, I, I would not enjoy that either. Um. So... Let's get into this, the big question that we've been getting. Uh, what? So, PlayStation 5 versus Xbox Series X, which would you recommend to somebody? And which do you actually use more? <laughs> or the Switch. We can throw the Switch in there, too. Three. So, look, first off, as far as, like, my own day-to-day -day use of it, this is going to sound like a total cop-out, but it's absolutely true. I have no idea which one I use the most. 
Like, I just kind of play the games as they come out, and I'm like, oh, I'll get this one on Xbox. I'll get this one on PlayStation. I kind of just keep changing my mind, and I go in, you know, there'll be a week where I'm playing PlayStation nonstop, and then a week where it's Xbox. And I have no idea which one actually is the higher total count right now. Um, as far as, like, which one I recommend to people, I mean, right now, I feel like I basically have to say PS5 just because of exclusives that are available. I think Xbox is definitely like a down the line, if you're going to get a second one, I highly recommend it. Uh, or if you don't care about the exclusives that PlayStation has, because I, I do like Xbox more in terms of the hardware as far as like it's smaller, it's quieter. Uh, there's a lot about that that I like more. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to play Demon Souls, you got one choice. <laughs> so like that that that's kind of where I like. Well, so if you get like Cyberpunk, where'd you play that? I did that on PC. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually, no, I'm, I'm very much platform agnostic. I don't actually care. Like, I, I don't consider myself, like, maybe vaguely a Nintendo fanboy as far as IPs go, but Nintendo, PC, Xbox, whatever, I play whatever makes sense to me for that given game. And Cyberpunk, to me, like, radiated PC energy because well, yeah. I know that that company has a bad history of doing console ports, and wow, was that extra chew this time around. So multi-platform games you just play wherever you don't have like a, a you don't lean a little bit towards one console for multi-platform stuff i do and i don't it's kind of weird actually i think i have these weird rules just set up in my head that make sense even though there's not really any real logic to them uh it's a little more complex than this but i feel like most of the time the way it works out is is it like a triple a third-party game from a Japanese dev, I'm getting it on PlayStation. Is it a Western dev? I get it on Xbox. Is it an indie title? I get it on Switch. It, there's a little more rules to that, but it kind of how it ends up working out most of the time. Okay. For whatever reason. That makes sense. <laughs> um, so indie titles Switch because that's just, they're usually not graphically intensive and like that's just a more convenient place to have it. For sure that. And then when it comes to like the whole Japanese versus Western dev, a lot of that I think has to more do with like tradition. You know, it's like, oh, the newest Kingdom Hearts is on Xbox, but I'm like, I, I played all those on PlayStation. You know, I feel, I feel like that. most Japanese devs are developing it for PlayStation because they don't really care about Xbox. Like, you see a couple companies opening up. Sega is doing a lot of ports now. Uh, Konami has been pretty open about multi-platform, at least back when they were releasing games. Uh, but I feel like definitely... Capcom and Square favor favor PlayStation a lot. Your I think your mic has like a noise gate on it or something because like when you start talking sometimes like the first word or two cuts out. Oh, I'll turn on the uh, gain a little bit. Um. So, I mean, I've been leaning towards Xbox for multi-platform stuff. I mean, like Call of Duty, I'm playing on Xbox. Um. I used to play it on Xbox just because I had more room on my Xbox and Call of Duty takes up like an insane amount of room. Um, but I, I just, I, I think I like the the UI and everything on Xbox better than on PlayStation. I honestly haven't touched my PlayStation 5 since Demon Souls because I mean, nothing's been out really. Yeah, I, that's mostly true for me too. Like I would say, so I played Demon's Souls a lot at launch, plus Miles Morales, and then I recently went back to start playing some of the other games I didn't put time into, like Spider-Man Remastered, uh, Little Big Planet, uh, or well, what is it, Sackboy's A Big Adventure, or whatever. Right. Yeah, so I've gone back and done some of those recently, and it's actually funny you say that because I agree with you totally on the UI part. Like I think the PS5 UI is very pretty, and it it kind of mm -hmm. sold me initially because it had this kind of like, oh, it's shiny and new. It felt like a new system more so, you know. Yeah. But actually putting time into it i maybe it's just because i'm more familiar with xbox because it's very similar to the old style so it feels comforting but i actually don't really love the ps5 ui it looks pretty but there's aspects of it that really bother me yeah there's like weird like choices like 1440p wasn't an option at all on on ps5 i think they just added it um the, being able to just hit the share button and it shows up on my phone when i want to like share a clip is like amazing and just like knowing that when i put a disc in or i download an xbox game i'm getting the series x version and i don't have to it's not this weird guessing game whether or not i'm getting the ps5 version or not that supposedly is fixed i haven't like tried testing any way to make it not happen but i, I think the last big update was like hey we figured it out guys we think <laughs> I had some weird stuff going on, like, uh, again, Call of Duty. Like, it just wouldn't boot 
I, I was incapable of playing Warzone because Warzone is like this weird game where it's like in between Modern Warfare and Cold War. And like uh, it downloaded the Modern Warfare version, but I had Cold War in there and they just, but it knew that I had the Modern Warfare version on my PS4. So it like, it was corrupted and just wouldn't load. And I don't think Fun. that ever got fixed. Um, but then there were other problems. Like uh, I, 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 something happened with like my Arkham when I tried to download that off of the uh, the free games. Whatever. Uh, it's just a lot easier for me on Xbox for whatever reason. And everything's backwards compatible. Everything works great. You just hit download if you had it on a previous console. I'm still playing freaking uh, Sonic Adventure 2 from my Xbox 360 arcade. Yeah, so. no, that's exactly it. I mean, that's even why I say, like, if you don't care about the exclusives on PlayStation, there's a lot about Xbox that I like more as far as just how it runs, you know? And then some people try to do the argument of, like, oh, you know, PS5 versions of games are all running better, and you look at the specs, and it's like, I mean, yeah, by, like, eight frames when it's already over yeah. 100. I, <laughs> that, that's that, cool. That's... Uh... <laughs> That's the important thing that I want to make very clear. If somebody asked me which one to get, I would probably say PlayStation because there's right now there's more exclusives on PlayStation. I think there's one on Xbox right now. The medium. That's, yes. Well, technically the medium. And then there's another game called Enlisted, which hasn't had a lot of attention brought to it. It's like a free to play shooter. I think I oh. honestly haven't looked into it much aside from the fact that it's another Xbox exclusive. That's not on Xbox one in the right. medium are it right now. And I don't think the PlayStation 5 is bad. I just think, I just, like, the Xbox is a slightly better experience for me personally. Like, yeah, that's, that's really it. It's not, it's not like I, it, it's, it's not like this giant console war to me. Like, I'm happy to play a game on either one. Uh, another weird thing that I noticed, uh, I was doing tests on, like, which, because, like, the Xbox Series X controller is supposed to have this, like, stuff to to make make it have less input lag it's got that like a uh, certain technology that like a certain like a certain way that it connects to the xbox to like uh lower the latency i forgot what it's called it's some copyrighted name for it yeah i don't remember it, there's some special name yeah but when you when you plug the xbox controller in and when you plug the playstation controller in, the playstation controller has less input lag interesting i actually had not tested that before I tested yep. it, and then a lot of people yelled at me because my test wasn't good enough. Because I think I used the triggers, and they were like, "Why are you using the triggers? It has more, it has less travel on PlayStation." I don't know, but for whatever reason, it seemed like the PlayStation controller had half as much input lag. But we're talking like four frames. You know, it's like not the end of the world. So I still play on yeah. Xbox. Yeah, not not something that's going to affect your ability to play a game necessarily. Like you could maybe argue at the highest level of competitive play, it might matter. But for what you're doing, it's like, yeah, we're good. Yeah, it's uh, and I just like the feel and the and the layout of the Xbox controller more, if, if I'm yeah. being honest. But the DualSense controller is great. P playing Astro's They're... Playroom was freaking awesome. Both great. I would actually say that like, if we're talking about like as controllers all around, all features included, I do like the DualSense a little more. But as far as just like raw layout goes, I like the Xbox One a lot more. It's much more or Xbox Series X at this point, I guess. The same thing. Yeah. But I like it feels more comfortable to me, you know. But yeah. yeah, the the fancier rumble and the adaptive triggers, all really cool. As long as games make use of them, it's awesome. If they don't, it's good still. Yeah. That yeah. I I mean the Dual Sense has more features for sure. The Xbox controller would be awesome if that crazy you know input lag technology actually worked but i don't have any proof that it does but one good selling point to the xbox controller is that most things work with it right out of the box like you plug it into a pc and it just works most emulators on pc will recognize an xbox controller and you have to do a little bit of finagling with the playstation controller even though the dual sense can work on with pc games with like a lot of pc games yeah and it's also, that's actually one thing I like the, about the Xbox platform more is that it's more open in some ways. Like, I don't know how often you use remote play. I use it every now and then just because I like the convenience. Mm -hmm. And with Xbox, they don't really limit you very much on what controllers you can use. Uh, so there's all kinds of like specially designed, you know, phone controllers that attach to the sides and make it feel like a little handheld portable, which I like because I love handhelds. So that works great. PlayStation's like uh, on-screen controls or DualShock. Yeah, that... that, that prevented me from using 
PlayStation Remote Play. Like, I want to do that because I would love to be able to play certain things like Death Stranding would be a great game to play remotely. But I have to have my DualShock 4 with me. Like, that's that's yeah. like, that's like not something I'm going to carry around with me. Yep. So, um, and that also prevents you from doing it on stuff like the Switch, like we were talking about that one time. Like, if you want to yep. do, like, the exactly. whole Android situation, it's like a whole pain in the ass. It's a massive bit. No, every time I've done any kind of Android hack video, I'm like, look, you really probably shouldn't do this. Like, it's not yeah. worth it in my opinion. Like, other people are all excited to try it out. I'm like, why? Like, I did it because I knew this is a thing that's, like, interesting to cover, but it just never feels actually worth it to me. I, I get tweets every now and then that are like, hey, man, uh, Android 10 is now out and it works great, but it's not really out. <laughs> it's like a pain in the ass to put on. So, like, I don't know what we're doing here, you know? It's a it's a weird sort of like uh like a uh, like bias these people have like they spent all the time putting it on there so they're like it works great I swear. <laughs> Ever do this? That's actually the thing that really bothers me the most is when people who are into that kind of stuff. Which to be fair, if if that's what you're into, awesome. I wish you the most happiness doing that kind of stuff. Like no hate. I'm not gatekeeping on what's fun for you. But at the same time, I hate when those people will like respond to someone else having a problem something and be like, oh, just do this. Like, yeah. just do this workaround. It's super easy. Like, I. All no, you had to do was know. open up Terminal, put this one little line of code in there, and then everything would work great. Yeah. And the Simple. second you tell me to open up Terminal, I'm out. I'm done. No mm -hmm. video's over. I get that a lot with those little emulators, like those little portable emulators that I talk about. Every time oh, I yeah. post a video, I will get something wrong. And somebody in the comments would be like, all you had to do was download this one thing that this one guy made, and then it runs great. Yeah. I'm not about it. I want the thing to work the second it comes to my face. Yeah. That was actually something I had recently with the Atari VCS, where I did a dumb video where I got Cyberpunk to work on yes. it, which we did do some <laughs> silly stuff with it. Uh, but one comment I got from a few people was like, oh, well, this isn't fair. You should have just added more RAM, because you can to the VCS. And I'm like, I mean, yes, but... The point is, I bought the thing, and here's how it is out of the box. There's so, lots of things you can mod to make better. That's how do you add more RAM to it? You just open it up. It's just a. It's basically a. Uh, there's a term for this. Uh, it's basically a full PC on a board. Like you can. Oh, there's okay. just a slot to do it. You just have to open it up. But yeah, it's not the VCS is not any kind of like weird proprietary design. Uh, it's really just the shell and the OS it's running for doing Atari games. Well, that's pretty cool that you could just friggin' upgrade it like that. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, did we get any notifications here? I I'm completely lost. Uh, Dolan, thank you for the three months. Chris, don't die, please don't. Thank you for the Prime subscription. Anthony Edward, thank you for the five months. X Tuck C, thank you for the Prime. Kate McCat, thank you for the ten months. Switch Indies are best Indies. I think we all agree here. And. Nam Circle, thank you for the seven months. Keep making great content. Thanks, dude. Um, so this just in, by the way, while we were talking, uh, they released the uh, Switch Online uh, games for February. February 17th, yeah. these will be out. Um, we got... First... All right, shut up, Nintendo. We got... Uh, for... Super Nintendo, Doomsday Warrior, Psycho Dream, and Prehistoric, spelt wrong, Man. And for NES, we got Fire and Ice. They are scraping the bottom of the barrel now. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I've like heard of some of these, but I don't think any of them are ones that I've spent any time playing at all. Yeah, I... I don't... Yeah, I don't recognize Which, hey, any of these. If if any of these happens to be a hidden gem that you love, great for you. That's, I'm very happy. <laughs> actually, which one is this? Psycho Dream. Psycho Dream looks sick. Actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing that one right now. That actually does look really. Cool. I'm gonna uh, have to check that out. Fire and Ice. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm sure that there uh, all this stuff is tied up in weird licensing issues because it's so oh, old. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's uh, why like. P 
people always ask for like classic consoles of other systems and it's like it's not that simple as just like snapping your fingers a lot of this gets <laughs> really confusing legally especially because like back then if you talk to any of those people as they were making these games and you're like hey what are your plans for when down the line people make redistributed versions of the system that come pre-installed do you have anything in your copyright for how to handle that situation and they go what <laughs> yeah that was the big thing with goldeneye uh when they remade that and then they were like we made it but I don't know if we could put it out. It turns out they couldn't put it out because the licensing was wrapped up in like a whole bunch of legal stuff. But I mean, people were crapping on Switch Online like the second it, well, like pretty early, even before that, people were mad that the Switch didn't have a virtual console type situation. Um, yeah. I'm wondering what's really different licensing wise. I mean, we're kind of moving towards subscription services anyway in like most cases like look at xbox we got freaking game pass which is awesome which we should have probably talked about we were talking about how great xbox is <laughs> um but i mean a lot of companies like capcom and sega took it upon themselves they're like they're not making a virtual console forget it we'll just make a collection ourselves and those collections are great like the mega man collection is awesome the sega collection is awesome except it doesn't have sonic 3 which is a problem weird situation for sure and i also don't know how things get messier because it is a subscription model right like what changes with having an individual listing for a game at four bucks versus having it as part of a like does that make things easier does it make it harder i this is not a thing that i've studied the full legal loopholes on right. you know but I, it, it it definitely seems like it would affect the situation yeah i, I would imagine it would make it harder because uh you have to like gauge how many people are downloading this thing and how much money does that company deserve because people are downloading this thing. But Nintendo, I'd imagine, made it even harder by being like, we're not doing virtual console. Who knows what we're going to do with your game? We're going to do this weird thing called Switch Online. I don't know. I, I mean, I like Switch Online. I think it's just fine, except for the uh, uh, bad, you know, uh, internet that their games have. <laughs> that their games yes. have bad net code um yeah no the net code in general is a major problem that's that's definitely the bigger issue because i agree i actually do like the subscription model especially for something like having those older games because if i really cared super hard about having access to like an individual copy of that game i i'll hunt down and actually get the game with some exceptions where it's like 400 bucks now for whatever reason uh but yeah, like I like the idea of just having a single subscription where it's just like, here's this list of however many titles. The library could use some work in some places, but I like the idea. Yeah, I mean, the, the only problem is they're running out of like, you know, content to put on it. I mean, I, actually, do we have Earthbound yet? That was the one thing everyone's like, why isn't Earthbound on it? And I'm pretty sure we have that now, right? I think we do. I don't actually, it's been a bit. Because last time I traded Earthbound, I was doing it on the SNES uh, Classic. Oh yeah, it's on that. I forgot. I mean, all these games are so easy to to just get now. <laughs> just yeah, literally, there's 50 million ways of getting these. Um, I actually don't see it. No earth. It doesn't look like it is. Yeah. Chat saying no. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, there's some good stuff. Well, there's some great stuff. Like Star Fox Two, amazing. It's awesome that they did that. Uh, yeah. but how hard would it be to just freaking put Earthbound on here? You know, it's what everybody yeah, wants. Especially, when you, especially with how much like third party stuff is on here too, right? Like, I was shocked when Breath of Fire was on there right away. I'm like, oh, that's a Capcom title, and that's just immediate. That was like one of the launch games for Nintendo Switch Online when they added Super Nintendo, which I would, did not expect. Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting that they're able to put some licensed stuff on here, especially Capcom because they have their own collections. Uh, but they're probably yeah. not doing much with those IPs, you know. Oh yeah, Breath of Fire's dead. It has like I think there was a mobile game that existed at one point in Japan only, and it didn't do great. And that's that's like the last we've heard from it, which makes me very sad. But <laughs> they're, they're not going to do like a Breath of Fire collection for the Switch. I, I mean, wish. Konami's doing oh, the Capcom, uh, the Castlevania collections. Yeah, well, I mean, but they're I not guess... releasing any games otherwise, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Saturn Valley says in the chat says they don't want to release JRPGs on Nintendo Switch Online. They must think there's too much content to give away for free. I think they have a bunch for the Japanese Switch Online. I think they have a couple of JRPGs. Yeah, I think Japan has Fire Emblem for NES. In the US, we have Breath of Fire 1 and 2. I think that might be it for JRPGs, though. Like, there's none of the Final Fantasies. There's none of the other, like, Square stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Eric Henley says, put Super Star Wars or I'm out. You ha- you are trolling. You know that that game is not a good game. <laughs> it's like one of those bad games that's nostalgic. Yeah, all those early Star Wars games are, are rough, man. Um, Where are we at? What should we talk about now? Should we talk about E3? Do you want to go there? My favorite. Yeah, we can talk about E3. This is a good this is a good one for us. Uh this is from Nintendo Life. The ESA confirms new details about its upcoming all digital three day E3 event. Uh the Entertainment Software Associations announced last year that they would go digital for E3 2021 because nobody gave a shit. Uh which will take place between the 15th and the 17th of June. Now amid questions on what the future of games conferences will be they have discussed their plans for this year which is 2021 oh wait this is confusing i thought they were talking about last year but they were talking about this year they were saying they were going to come back this year but now they're doing a digital thing Every summer since 1995, the Electronic Entertainment Expo, known as E3, has taken place in the U.S. It's one of the biggest gaming conventions in the world, widely attended by games press, and is usually one of the main times and places where new announcements, reveals, and trailers can be seen for the first time. For many of those years, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft shared the stage as presenters, but over time, various publishers have pulled back from it. In 2013, Nintendo switched to pre-recorded video announcements, direct style rather than on-stage press conferences. EA, Sony, Ubisoft, Activision, and Bethesda followed suit in the following years, with some studios holding their own conferences instead of having them hosted by E3. Last year was the first year E3 failed to materialize due to the pandemic reaching critical mass during the planning stages. Despite initial plans to hold a digital version, there wasn't enough time to make it work, leading to the cancellation of the whole thing. Good. Fuck them. Thanks to a report from VGC, we know that the three-day event will involve live-streamed coverage from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, including two-hour-long keynote presentations from games partners, in quotes, likely meaning large development studios and smaller streams from publishers, indies, and influencers. Quote, regional replays across Europe, China, and Middle East will ensure that no one misses out on the news. Game demos will be available to the public, blah, 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 on June 14th, uh, the day before E3 is due to begin a preview night will be happening, although there are currently no details. Jeff Keighley will not be there, and he's planning to continue his Summer Games Fest. Um, VGC states that it's not yet clear which publishers have signed up for the digital version of E3, but that it, quote, at least... At least one major games, at least one major games company is going ahead with their own showcase rather than paying the quote six figure sums to appear at the digital version of E3. So if it's not clear, E3 was all digital last year. Well, actually, it didn't happen at all. It, it didn't was, happen. Yeah. They tried to make it all digital and it failed completely. And uh, they decided to just stop it. And this year they're trying it again. They're going to try again to be all digital. Um, but here they are asking for, quote, six figure sums for companies to be a part of their digital showcase. What a mess. <laughs> what, what benefit would they provide to a publisher that they can't provide on their own. Like, I think there must be this idea that there's like a prestige for being a part of E3 because it's like the name power of the event. But that's been kind of slowly dwindling apart over the years anyways. And to top that off, I mean, again, companies can do their own thing. I don't think anyone's going to be, if Xbox brings, if Xbox, Sony, Nintendo, whoever, brings just as many announcements as they would have in their own digital press conference later on the hype levels are basically the same right like the only thing that kind of benefits them and this is a gamble is if you can one up the other guy at the same show you know (laughs) it's like oh we had more reveals than xbox did ha look at how amazing our exclusives are you know like that's that's a cool feeling and that makes it beneficial like for fans to have that competition but from their standpoint it's better just to do stuff on your own timeline 
I, I think this provides a benefit to smaller companies or unknown companies because they could pay to be they, they buy they're basically buying a seat with the big dogs but yeah. they're not gonna have over a hundred thousand dollars to to right. get that seat you know and, and and how how big is that return going to be versus having a hundred thousand dollars extra in just marketing and advertising yeah it, or the, piggybacking you, you, off of someone else's event it's literally just to say as seen at e3 or something like that or best to show e3 if they could even manage to do that yeah um, and like value wise for companies before like they would pay to be there but it's because you're getting a spot there there's like you know you're setting up places you're getting marketing all that kind of stuff and now it's just hey you'll be on this stream yeah <laughs> which you could do you like if nintendo makes an announcement or even if ea decides we want to announce a new star wars game they could just tweet that there's zero reason for them to make a big you know stink at an e3 type conference they could literally just send out a tweet and it'll be on all of the major gaming news sites yeah that's what paper mario did paper mario was a tweet just one yep. day <laughs> and that's how it was announced nintendo figured it out you know first like years ago they were like we because i mean e3 has always charged an exorbitant amount to be a part of it so uh they were like you know what we could just make our own video we don't need to have it shown to you we're freaking nintendo everybody's gonna want to see what we have anyway but who was the first to not be on the floor was it microsoft they moved to their they had because they had the microsoft theater next to the to uh the la convention center yeah, and I don't know, I think they were still technically apart, but they just hosted, like, their demos at a separate place. Mm -hmm. EA, I think, was the first to, like, fully leave, and they just had their own event across the way. They were like, oh, we're running EA Play. That just so happens to be during the same week as E3. That's we're not right. directly related, though. Yeah, but, like, you had to have a separate badge and everything to go. You couldn't have an E3 badge. That's either. right. I forgot about that. Because, I mean, it's an exorbitant amount of money, and they're like, you know what? I mean, we have big games. Like, we don't need to, <laughs> we don't need to, like pay this much and then i think microsoft did the same thing um microsoft was just straight up like we don't need to be on the floor we can be right next door we have the place for it um playstation just straight up left <laughs> that's true uh that was 2019 right were they just not there yeah they were just not there no presence no announcements nothing uh which to be fair their 2018 conference got like a little bit of flack but whatever they still brought out gave great games it, that everyone it, loved it seemed like they were like moving away from games at one point like in 2019 when they, when it was when they were like you know not really there um yeah oh wait, we're talking about playstation yeah PlayStation. i'm thinking about xbox i'm stupid don't listen to me. <laughs> um oh yes that okay 2019 was the year where everyone's like all right they're gonna be quiet this year and then the next year they're gonna be big and bold with their playstation 5 um but yeah i mean Publishers and 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 big game companies and stuff have been slowly pulling out of E3 for for a while because it's it, it they charge an exorbitant amount. Uh, the return isn't that great because the internet exists, and uh, it's a pain in the ass to like go to E3 and it's not run well. <laughs> it's not, and the part of the problem too is for like smaller guys, right? Is that if you were a smaller company, the one big upside to E3, aside from like you were saying earlier, you know, being on the stage with the big boys or whatever was also the fact that you could network you could meet people you yes. could you know there might be a there's a producer you know someone from a major company that you would love to get backing for what you're working on or something you know and that's not an option anymore if it's an all digital event yeah that was i mean i liked going to e3 at first it was just because you know it's like a prestigious thing it's like oh i got to go to e3 and then like the second or third e3 i was like all right this this sucks this isn't like some this isn't like as fun or exciting as it looks like from the outside but i liked going because i enjoyed the process of like rushing to like a game and like trying to get videos out that week but the videos didn't do great and like there wasn't really any benefit like monetarily to being there versus just covering it from home the only real benefit is like you said the networking like actually meeting people and hanging out with and uh, other people and like getting uh relationships going we for example met at e3 we did 
For the first time in person, at least, yeah. yeah I think we talked time. a little bit like before, but yeah, that was our first like actual meetup. And th that's the thing too, right? Like anyone who's a content creator, when it came to a major event like E3, you'd think, oh, this is a great opportunity to do stuff. It's not. It's no. really not. Because in the time it takes you to be on the show floor and try to like get, unless you have exclusive like backstage access to something, you know, like I, uh, one E3, uh, really one of my best videos to come out of E3 was because Hori let me try out the split pad pro, uh, before there was really any videos. Like people had announcement videos, but I was like, oh, hands on with it. Yeah. And that was one that did really well for me, but anything else you try to make, like, I think I did a smash brothers video one year when ultimate was being, uh, teased and everything. And it's like in the time it took me to try hands on the demo and share my thoughts, everyone else has done analyses of the gameplay demos and they're watching that instead. Yeah, because doing stuff from home is way faster. Yeah, the, the 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 competition was very fierce. I mean, I mean, it was fun to make hands on videos because then you know all those people at home can do say hands on. I actually played the new Smash Brothers, but like, you know, for 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 relatively small or like low like relatively small channels with like low teams, like you can't have like like me and you can't have like correspondence go into other like games and everybody plays a game and then makes a video real quick like yeah i would have to pick one game and i have to floor it to that game and then wait online for three hours because i don't have a freaking exclusive pass to nintendo because they don't give a shit about us yep. um like that that would that was like it's it's fun and also a pain in the ass at the same time if if that makes sense but part of the reason why it was such a pain in the ass was because of the way that the convention was set up they opened it up to the public which was um like i understand why they would do that and it makes a lot of sense like pax is my favorite convention because it's just always been open and it's great to have everybody there but e3 is this weird sort of pseudo like it's for media you get to play announcements and stuff but also the floodgates are open so you have to fight with everybody else too to get these games um Oh, and it was it was a huge problem the first year they opened it up too because later on they started changing it to being like oh there's industry only hours and that kind of thing mm -hmm. but the first year they opened it up they didn't really change much as far as how they were budgeting like space and security so that year was awful because you had lines that couldn't fit anywhere and there were multiple instances of people being like oh i forgot i brought a knife with me today <laughs> <laughs> it's like how did that get through? I, like, how did someone catch that? Like, not I catch have, that. I have been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one year, one year we were sent by Bandai. Well, we weren't sent by them. They gave us passes, but they gave us gamer passes, which was the public pass mm -hmm. to cover their stuff. And I guess nobody told them or they just didn't care that you're not allowed to bring a camera with an interchangeable lens if you have a gamer pass so uh, i had to i had to give dan who's in the chat right now i had to give him my freaking camera to smuggle in and then i had to pick it up from him on the other side and will for whatever reason had a bigger camera than me but it was a camcorder and they let him in because the cat the lens wasn't interchangeable yeah. and i had the opposite problem one time where like i was media and security stopped me because they're like, oh, you can't have like this much stuff with you. And it's like, I'm media. That's like, I've read the rules and thoroughly know them. Like, I know we can bring this. He's like, uh, no, I can't let you. I'm like, call your supervisor. Because <laughs> they <laughs> let me in because I was like, this is bull. Like, I need to shoot stuff. Like, yeah, I, I got work to do right it's now. It's <laughs> my job. This is a media event. I need to cover it. Like, I'm here. Like, this whole event is is made so that I could post about it, you know, so that people like me can can put the word out about it. And, you know, um, afford rent. <laughs> yes. I think that same year where I had to smuggle my freaking camera in, uh, they changed the backpack rules on the second day. So they, they yeah. were, so at first you had to meet a certain requirement of the size backpack. And then the second day they were like, no backpacks at all. Everybody go back home and drop your backpacks off. So I just went on a different line and then until one of them would let me in. <laughs> but all that is is brought to a calamity in 2019 where they leaked where they doxed everybody who was a journalist that was that was rough i i found out so, so uh, apparently everybody who was on the media list or everybody who signed up on the website uh got all their information leaked um which was an absolute nightmare for all of us 
Um, I found out because Spawn Wave texted me my home address and said nothing else. And I said, all right, dude, that's real funny. What the fuck? <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember how I found out, which I didn't fully, I wasn't fully cognizant at the time. Uh, that night, you're the one who told me because that night I was celebrating. Uh, I got yes. engaged that day. And so I was celebrating, I was with people, and I definitely had a little bit too much to drink that day, <laughs> like having a great time with friends. And I, I did a thing where I was just like, it's went to Spawn Waves chat, because we were all a lot more uh, active there back then, just doing random chats. And like, hey guys, like this isn't exactly related to work, but like, I just got engaged, ah. And then you were like, great for you, you got doxxed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it was like a big group chat that you were that we were like a part of that was like trying to warn everybody that shit was going down. Uh and you were <laughs> and you were like, "Oh, whoops. Ah, who cares?" Yeah, I was uh I was having too much fun at the time. <laughs> it, it really wasn't that big of I mean, I was getting like, you know, like weird like messages and phone calls and stuff and and you know, weird threats and whatnot. But uh it it all got real serious when I started to get pizzas delivered to my house. And I live in yeah, New that... York, so if you're sending a Papa John's pizza to my house, it's like <laughs> a hate crime. And that was while I was, I... this was all going on while I was streaming. So it was one of those things like where it's it's like swatting, but like the, the like the friendly version of swatting, except they were still sending right. death threats to my phone. Um, Just a bad food to throw away. Yeah, well, I, I mean, have... I I would have to pay for it. Is the thing like they didn't pay for it? They they ex... it was right. I had to turn away the pizza. Yeah, I also I had to call the police lucky. because I had to be like, hey, I'm getting pizza sent to my house. So the next step is being swatted. So I and and the guy, the, the policeman was like, yeah, I was going to ask if this was a swatting situation. So I, I had to be like put on a list where where if, if like they get a phone call and that says like I'm Bob Wolf and I got my family in the closet <laughs> and I'm not letting them out. They, they know to call me and be like, was that really you? And I'll be like, no, I'm being swatted. That, I actually got lucky, I think because I was registered under, like, my company title or whatever. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, Kevin Kenson Gaming, here's their address and everything. Like, it was under the company name. So I don't think anyone really, like, put that together. Oh, I think right. everyone was looking for the easy ones, right? They just kind of quickly scroll through, and it's like, oh, Bob Wolf, I know who that is. Well, yeah. people went down the list. P people, like... We got people went down the list and got put on these like mailing lists and like you know read like just bombed everybody right um, luckily i have since moved so uh if you'd like to send my parents pizza go nuts but uh it'll uh, you know and you don't want to you don't want to mess with a uh, ornery uh ornery old people from long island um but anyway that is why e3 sucks and that is why i like made clear i was like i made the decision right then and there i was like I'm, i've already been fed up with e3 i am definitely not going to a 2020 e3 if they ever have one I, they're on my shit list now I'm, I'm, I'm they care very little about us as media and the whole event is a media event so why am i even going to bother with them so i was very happy to hear that 2020 they decided to not do it at all yeah i i was debating for 2020 because like I was also fed up, but that was also the year when, you know, Xbox Series X and PS5 are coming out. So I'm like, oh, if I can get any kind of early access, like that could be, that could be really cool. But I, I even told myself, like, if I go, it's for that alone. And then I'm not going the next year. Like, it's just, it's just timing. Well, it's a little easier for you too, because you're, you're over there already. The, the true too. Yeah. I live in SoCal, so it's not difficult for me to go. Yeah. It's like a whole production. I gotta like, you know, get, I gotta get like, you know, so like a camera person. And I got to fly over there and get a hotel and whatnot. And also getting like a place in LA, like an Airbnb or a hotel that's like close to the convention center. So you don't need a car is like friggin' a nightmare. It's expensive as all hell. Uh, yes. And also it's just, it's just really hard to get around downtown LA. Yeah. That I can agree with. <laughs> and when you think you're like close to the convention center, you're not. Or you have to like go under the overpasses and go through like freaking the, the the tent cities and stuff. Uh, yes, E, we're talking about E three. Welcome. <laughs> um, so like, so yeah, here we are. 
they're trying again to do an all digital thing. I hope that it fails. I hope that E3 learns that. I hope that the ESA learns that E that nobody needs E3. It it kind of it was kind of nice to have all of the announcements in one week. Like last year, it kind of sucked having things leaked out like throughout the whole summer. Um, but you know, I'd rather have that than deal with that garbage convention. Yeah, and the thing is too, like for this year, I don't know if I see any of the, like I know like whatever there's a tease of at least one big company is going to be there, but I don't see any of like the really big ones actually showing up. Like I just I don't see how it's beneficial to uh, Sony's definitely not going to do it because they already bowed out the year before. I don't see it really being in Nintendo's interest. Then again, Nintendo makes weird decisions all the time, so maybe they would still <laughs> go for it and do it direct at the same time. I don't know. Like I just don't see how it's a good move for any of them. Like maybe for one of the big third parties, but I think the same thing that happened last year is going to happen this year. E3 is going to be like, Hey, we're doing an all digital event and then nobody's going to want to be a part of it. And then they're going to cancel it. I think that this will be canceled very soon. I think they'll realize they have no footing and they'll be like, forget it. We'll try again next year. I don't know. We'll see. It's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's that on that. That's that on E3, folks. Uh, confirmed, Bob hates homeless people. I live in Brooklyn. You can't live here and hate homeless people. Yeah, he just said he walks through Ted cities, that's all. Yeah, was, did, was, I, was, did I, was, I was not? <laughs> <laughs> um, over here where I live, it's like every hour on the hour, there's just a guy outside that goes, hey! That's it. It's like it's like it's like a it's like a church bell. Five a.m. already. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Bish, thank you for the Prime subscription. I appreciate you. Just use your Heelys, Bob. That's right. I should have brought Heelys to E3. What's this nonsense? Mario's uh, the the pin set for Mario's thirty fifth anniversary may be impossible to complete. Have you tried to be doing this? Did you get the first pin set? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. So I, I did and I didn't try for the first pin set because I remember when they announced it, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do all these challenges, and I did them like for the initial ones, and there were the later ones that were like, you know, oh, you have to submit the code for buying the game and all that kind of stuff, um, and I kind of just forgot and never followed through. <laughs> I, I think I did the same thing. Well, I heard about it and I was like, oh, that looks cool. And then I just never did the work. For the second one, I've been trying, but it is not easy. There's like a lot you got to do and you have to keep up with it because they announced it with missions that were impossible to complete unless you did them already. Yeah, because some of them were the missions from the first run, but some of those were like, oh, play Mario Kart on the phone during this week. And it's like that week was well before you announced yeah. the second challenge. <laughs> It's really like if you had tried the first time and lost out on the raffle at the end or whatever, like here's your second chance kind of is really what it more is. Yeah. It's not a way for anyone that didn't try before, which is really frustrating. It is a little frustrating. I, I, I But they are releasing new missions that you can do every once in a while to like, you know, uh, up your chances or, or give you another chance. I know um, they're and, selling pin sets separately. I don't know if it's like the same ones in any group. or uh, if like They have these. <laughs> These are the Penny Arcade ones that they were supposed to have at PAX. Mm. Um, these, uh, me and E went to the Nintendo store like a few weeks ago. Um, and they had all of these. They had ones for each Mario game. I think there were four. They're $25 each. So these three so pins I, were $25. I've had this talk with people because I had a really big pin phase. And I still buy some pins every now and then, but I was I was doing that... that uh, that jacket for a while that was like the jean jacket and I had all the pins on it and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's actually not that bad. Like if you're 25. buying high quality, yeah, if you're buying high quality pins from someone, it's like nine bucks easy for a single pin. It's just the fact that it's a forced bundle that really makes it even more expensive. Like the forced bundle is the worst part about it. You mean for the, you mean for these or you mean for the whole set? For those. Like the fact that the, what makes it expensive is that you can only buy it in a $25 bundle as opposed to being able to do like $8 piecemeal because right, that individual right. pricing really isn't that bad. It's just, at least if you're getting good pins. I mean, there's cheap pins everywhere for like three bucks, but they're not good. Right, right. Um, Yeah, I didn't even 
they don't even tell you the price or anything. They're like behind the counter at the Nintendo store. So like E was like, I'll take all those pins. That's a hundred dollars right there. And he had no idea. <laughs> um, so anyway, Mario's second uh, set of 35th anniversary pin missions may be impossible to complete. This is from IGN. The missions are uh, for the missions for the second set of pins celebrating Mario's 35th anniversary have been available for some time, but your chance to obtain the pins based on such games as Super Mario Sunshine, Galaxy, Super Mario Odyssey, may be over unless you have completed expired missions and purchased Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. I forgot I have to pre-order them. Um, oh, crap. Nintendo recently updated the list of missions for Mario Celebration, adding a handful of new tasks to complete to be eligible for the second pin set. I gotta look at that. However, many of the previous missions have ex since expired and can no longer be completed. You'll need to complete 14 missions plus purchase the upcoming 3D World and Bowser's Fury for a total of 15 out of 22 missions before receiving a code for the second wave. Oh, only 15? I think I have that. I have 15. Yeah. I so you're wait. ready. Did I pre-order it? No, I didn't. I guess I don't have to. You only need 15? Saying that to access the other missions, you have to... Is that what it was? I don't know why this is so confusing. Uh... Nintendo. <laughs> for You'll need to complete 14 missions plus purchase Bowser's Fury for the 15 out of 22 missions before receiving a, a, a wave 2 pinned code. This likely means that most people looking to obtain the newest set of pins won't be able to as the most you'll be able to complete is 12 of the 15 required. Oh, so there are 15 required. As of February 5th, completing 14 missions is impossible unless you have already completed at least two missions that are no longer available. These include Splatoon 2 Splatfest Online Challenge, which I specifically did just for the pin set, which I never would have played Splatoon otherwise. Um... <laughs> Nintendo versus Challenge Cup, uh, Box Lunches Super Mario Must Haves on Box Lunch Tetris 18th Maximus Cup, which was like way before like the the missions were even announced, and Super Mario Maker 2 Ninja Speed Run Online Challenge, which I did, and I don't know if it registered that. How would it know? Oh, it did know. Okay. Probably just because your yeah you, your Nintendo account was what you were logged into while playing. Interesting. Oh, and Super Mario Kart Tour event. Bear in mind, two missions require ha, require having purchased 3D All Stars and playing Super Mario Brothers Three. Uh, so I'm sorry, Super Mario Thirty Five, the latter which requires a Nintendo Switch Online paid membership. All right, dude. Like we get it. You're gonna have to spend money to get some freaking some of these missions. So if you are interested in the pins, you're pro potentially on the hook for two games, for two sixty dollar games plus a twenty dollar membership. Uh, if you are one of the lucky few who are still on the hunt, be sure to check out our wiki page for getting the stuff. All right, well, I got it. Looks like I'm in, baby. Yeah, you don't even, you're, you're like, oh, no one else can get in. I don't care. More for uh, me. <laughs> I didn't even redeem my cold stone co code. I gotta get that. Um, I am gonna still pre-order or purchase Bowser's Fury. So I'm in a weird spot. Um, I ha So I like I, I pre-ordered it from a local place that breaks street date all the time. So I'm going to have a physical copy, but I like having digital copies. So what I'm going to do is purchase it online. I'm going to purchase it from them and then probably give the game away in some capacity, probably here on Twitch. Because um, I'm an asshole and I just like having things all digital. So I'll fine. still, I know I'll still get that code then. Yeah, that's fine. I know someone who's worse. I know a guy who's buying like five copies of Persona 5 Strikers because he wants to have it on both systems, but he also wants the early access that you get from the digital access. But he also wants to have like the steelbook cases and stuff. So he's just buying it that many times. Holy crap. I, I yeah. wish I loved something that much. <laughs> <laughs> I think just it's just anything. par for course for him. I, I think that's just how he absorbs content. He's just like, I got to have all the limited stuff. <laughs> I need it. Are you doing anything for the uh, uh, the Mario Edition Switch? 
I'm going to try and do an unboxing if I get my hands on one. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have a hookup that'll at least make it easier for me to get one. I, I don't have like a guarantee, but I'm 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 hoping I'm able to grab one so I can do an unboxing this weekend. But I uh, don't know for sure. It's kind of a gamble right now. I'm in the same boat. I'm uh, I'm going to the Nintendo store uh, the day it you know comes out yeah. and hoping for the best. But that means I gotta yeah. wake up before noon, and that might be a problem. What time do you normally get up, Bob? I don't. I don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Your health's important to me, Bob. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Uh, and hey, uh, Ro Robo Jack, thanks for the Prime subscription, and Wolf Howl, thanks for the three months. Uh, Wolf cute, Wolf yeet. And T Compy, thank you for the two months of primes. I appreciate you. We got another big news here, big news time that happened. Uh, CD Projekt Red got hacked this and morning, all, or, and all their yeah. important information was uh, ransomed. I'll just read the tweet. It's really the important bit. They, CD Projekt Red tweeted out with a white background this time because they're not sorry about this. You know, this is something that happened to them. Um, they said, yesterday we discovered that we have become a victim of a targeted cyber attack due to which some of our internal systems have been compromised. An unidentified actor gained unauthorized access to our internal network, collected certain data belonging to CD Projekt uh, Capital Group, and left a ransom note, the content of which we release to the public. Although some devices in our network have been encrypted, our backups remain intact. We have already secured our IT infrastructure and began restoring the data. Uh, we will not give in to the demands nor negotiate with the actor, being aware that this may eventually lead to the release of the compromised data. We are taking necessary steps to mitigate the consequences of such a release, in particular by approaching any parties that may be affected due to the breach, which is probably their own em employees. We are still investigating the incident. However, at this time, we can confirm that to our best knowledge, the compromised systems did not contain any personal data of our players or users of our services. We have already approached the relevant authorities, including law enforcement and the president of the Personal Data Protection Office, as well as IT forensic specialists, and we will closely cooperate with them in order to fully investigate this incident. And then the next slide here is the the readme file that the hacker left on somewhere. It's, it says, hello, CD Projekt. Your your have been epically pwned. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a 90s movie. We have dumped full copies of the source codes from your per, perfor, Perforce server for Cyberpunk 2077, Witcher 3, Gwent, and the unreleased version of Witcher 3. We have also dumped all of your documents relating to accounting, administration, legal HR, investor relations, and more. Also, we have encrypted all of your servers, but we understand that you can most likely recover from backups. If we will not come to an agreement, then your source codes will be sold or leaked online and your documents will be sent to our contacts in gaming journalism. Ooh, your public image will go down the shitter even more and people will see how your shitty, how, how you shitty your company functions. Investors will lose trust in your company and the stock will, uh, will dive even lower. You have 48 hours to contact us. And this was as of three in the morning. I think that's, I think that's a uh, Pacific time though. No, my, my computer's all messed up. I don't know when that was. It was sometime in the middle of the night. So, uh, I mean, apparently there was an unreleased version of The Witcher 3 that we now know about, but I mean, what could possibly be different about that? There was It was released on a lot of stuff. It's probably just a PS5 Series X like update. True. Yeah, just some kind of like enhanced edition kind of thing. Just like, oh, the reflections are better. Cool. Would be my guess. 
it could be that um i think the most damning stuff is probably the internal like uh like emails and stuff that that like they that the employees would have with each other uh which is oh, which is like really shitty like it like yeah like cd project like messed up developing a game but does that mean that their personal like data should be leaked like this i don't think so and what messes it up too right i was having a talk with some uh the guys i work with this morning like it's really hard to walk this line of like whenever something bad happens in the game industry with a particular like dev normally it's the higher ups that are actually the problem uh yes. and the dev you know usually is just actually just trying to get their jobs done and you know still have that emotional attachment to what they're creating in a lot of cases and it's like this doesn't help them like if you want to take the stance of like oh i'm doing this to like punish these guys for being jerks and you know this is for the little guy and it's like no all those devs are also now screwed because you're yeah. leaking your info and like a lot of them could be out of a job because of this if it did have some kind of like crazy implications like that's it's a much more complex issue than just like CDPR bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 that's part of the problem with like uh, putting a label on like an entire company. Like, there's people that work at that company. You know, there's like a lot of those people, most of those people, don't deserve something like this. Um, yep. This could have really bad like repercussions for a lot of those people. Um, that being said, uh, you know the 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 higher ups are the ones who probably uh uh are the one i don't want to say no never mind <laughs> like those are the ones that you don't like but you don't target them either you know what i'm saying somebody like uh like the freaking guy who runs a uh, uh gearbox like he like he had some bad controversies and like that's kind of warranted like the controversies he's been in um cg project red made a bad game that people were excited about like i don't think that's something to like drag somebody over you know yeah and like i mean there's a little nuance to it in terms of like what was promised and what was advertised and that kind of thing and like releasing a game in good or bad faith uh, but it certainly isn't like they weren't caught sacrificing orphans to help the yeah. game sale or something, right? Like it's there's there's lines here. Like they should absolutely be criticized, but there's a difference between criti criticism and like whatever this is in if it's meant to be a form of punishment and not necessarily just like a trying to make a buck. Yeah, I don't know. I I feel like a lot of people like like hackers like this they don't understand that like there's actual real world repercussions like they could go to jail for like a really really long time for 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 uh blackmail like this yeah they just think it's like cool memes like how it starts you've been epically pwned lol lol like no dude you could go to jail <laughs> <laughs> you you might also be right. epically pwned at the end I don't know what else this article says. Uh, oh, they've been hacked before. CD Projekt Red was hacked in 2017 and said at the time in a similar message that the thieves had stolen documents connected to early designs for the upcoming game Cyberpunk 2077, though nothing much came of that incident. The hacker, the latest hack sounds more serious. Also, 2017, there was probably nothing finished or nothing like tangible for Cyberpunk at the time. <laughs> Probably more the, like the, the overall plan and what they wanted to try and get done in that time frame, which we saw what we got. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a terrible situation, I think. I think nothing good can come of that for anybody. Yes. Uh, anyway, here's another thing. Terraria. Have you ever played Terraria? A long time ago. I played that when it was like whatever early, early super release, uh, however many years ago that was. It was a long time ago. But I, I did play a tiny bit. I did not keep up with it. I have never touched it. Um, to, to my understanding, it's like a 2D Minecraft. That's like the short pitch. I think it probably doesn't like completely do it justice, but I, I think to most people you can say that and that gets the idea across. Okay. Well, Terraria uh, canceled on Google Stadia because the developer doesn't like Google right now. For pretty so, good reason. Yeah. But you know what? It sounds like, I mean, I should just read the article, but it sounds like uh, what happened to him could just happen to anybody. 
and he's just working on a game for stadia and he's like forget it i don't need you he's got he's in a better position to like to like scooch back at google than you know most other people would be if they were in his situation but anyway uh can i just read his tweets so we'll get the idea across uh so andrew spinks who is the developer of uh of terraria says uh my google account has now been disabled for over three weeks i still have no idea why and after using every resource i have to get this resolved you have done nothing but given me the runaround my phone has lost access to thousands of dollars of apps on Google Play. I had just bought Lord of the Rings 4K and can't finish it. <laughs> My Google hey, Drive data. Stuff. That, this is real. This is real serious. My Google Drive data is completely gone. I can't access my YouTube channel. The worst of all is losing access to my Gmail address of over 15 years. I have. Uh, I absolutely have not done anything to violate your terms of service, so I can take this no other way than you deciding to burn this bridge. Cons he, like, took this really personally. Consider it burned. Terraria for Google Stadia is canceled. My company will no longer support any of your platforms moving forward. I will not be involved with corporations that value their cu customers and partners so little. Doing business with you is a liability. He's very mad about it. I mean, I would, I would be mad too if like my Google account that's like associated with the YouTube channel is like, you know, like this. Gone. But I'd imagine, I mean, he had to. How could he not? Maybe this is like a testament to how disconnected Stadia is from the rest of Google because like he's making a game for Stadia. They've got to have some sort of contact to be able to get his stuff back, you know? I feel like with most really big companies, there's oftentimes a problem of like the left hand not talking to the right. I mean, you even see that with YouTube sometimes when it's like how they design and develop the algorithm and then how people try to te train you on like, oh, here's how to like best make sure your video gets shared. And most of the time, it's not actually good information. Uh, yeah, and that's I mean, the kind of thing. A lot of uh, all the people I've talked to at YouTube say that no one person knows how the algorithm works. So like it's, even it's, they at YouTube that have no idea. <laughs> yeah. These guys made some code that makes stuff work a certain way. And then they don't like the other side who talks to everyone is just like, yeah, it makes your video visible because of this. But that's exactly the kind of stuff with this, right? It's like, there's got to be someone he can contact, but it's got to be pulling teeth to figure that out. And it's plus, true. if he doesn't have his Gmail account, how's he contacting him? It was probably all through email before. I mean, yeah, we've both dealt with YouTube before when there's certain problems and we know that there's like, it's a huge pain in the ass, but uh, eventually we get through, you know, sometimes, sometimes not, but it's usually not that important when we don't. <laughs> um, but here is Team YouTube responding to this man saying, we're sorry to hear you're going through this. Without revealing any personal info, share more details about how you lost access to your account. We'll wait to hear from you and point you in the right direction. This account is like a little tone deaf. Like it's like a it's like half a bot that like tries to help people who have YouTube problems. I feel yeah, like they're like they're like obligated to respond to things. Yeah, that's absolutely an auto-generated. Like, oh, someone said they can't access their account. Here's this auto reply. That that uh. tweet has fifty six likes. And this random person who replied under it says that this is the worst automated response you could have given, and it has a thousand likes. <laughs> that ratio. <laughs> they got freaking ratioed hard. Yeah, I could see the frustration here. Um, yeah. Like, and like, talk about that timing, right? Like, this is yeah. right after Stadia announces that they're closing down their own first party studios, and they're still trying to, like, built some hype because i know right before that at ces they were like hey all these tvs are now coming pre-installed with stadia support isn't that cool uh but then you know regardless of whether or not someone likes terraria seeing that kind of major push on social networks just being like to hell with these guys like that just adds more and more to the fire i love people who all brought back up I don't know if you remember this, but when they did like the big Stadia reveal event, they had a setup where it's like, oh, look at all these important releases in history. And it was like a Dreamcast, uh, Power <laughs> Glove, 
<laughs> and what was the third one? The third one was some, it was like a connect or something. It was just like three things that did not do good. <laughs> <laughs> and like Stadia is the next step, guys. Uh, they really handled Stadia very poorly. I feel like it had such good potential. Like, look at freaking Game Pass, dude. Game Pass is awesome, and Remote Play is awesome. And there is such a good niche for that. It is like a good future. But and state, and Google was in a position to, like, make it great, and they just completely shit the bed on it. It, it got released too early and they did not do the right move in introducing it. Like, I remember one of the big things I argued about early on was that, because uh, there's a free version and a pay for version, right? But the pay for version released first. So everyone yeah. forgot the free version existed and they were like, oh, I got to pay this much to be able to like buy games through Stadia. That's stupid. It's like, no, no, it's actually free. It's just there's a premium one. and uh, uh, It's mind. still confusing. I don't know if the free version is like really all there like i think you still need a stadia controller or something yeah the well, yeah so you still need like the hardware to run it which includes the controller but i think the free version aside from buying like the setup kit was like i don't remember you cap out at 1080p resolution and something else there were limits to what you could do uh, right. Oh, and premium gave you like a free game every year, every month or something. But so, so like, yeah. I don't think the technical limitations are like a big deal, like as big as everybody was saying. Because like when it was announced, everybody was they, when it was announced, they were saying it's going to be 4K, 60 frames. It's going to be awesome. Everyone's going to love it. But they didn't say not everyone's going to get 4K 60. It depends on your internet, and uh, not many games are going to support it, and uh, it's not going to look great. You know. Like, that's not why, like, I don't play games on my Switch for a 1080p 60 frame experience. I play it because it's convenient. Google Stadia yeah. should have been advertised like it's free. If you don't have the hardware to play a game, all you got to do is buy the one game. That's a great selling point. Like, maybe yep. somebody doesn't have an Xbox Series X to play Cyberpunk. Well, you could just buy Cyberpunk. That's a great selling point. But they didn't yeah. do that. Well, that's even actually after Cyberpunk came out, they did lean into that a little bit. I mean, they this did is like a bundle, right? Done. Well, they not even that. It's just the fact that like they hard pushed an advertising like, oh, does Cyberpunk suck on consoles? Play it on Stadia. It's great. Because I think other people were <laughs> ranking like, oh, on the list, Stadia is like the third best. It's like PC, Series X, Stadia, PS5, and like everything else below it is just unplayable mess. Is and Series so X really up there? Eating that up. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's still a broken mess, but like hmm. it runs. I mean, I mean it doesn't I, it doesn't crash as much. I played it a little bit on my Series X, and I actually it didn't. I didn't really have that many problems. I mean, there was like weird like like you know like animations, but like for the most part, oh, yeah. like it ran fine on my Series X. I didn't of, know of that I was having versions. like a. I didn't know it was like a better experience on Series X than other stuff. Yeah, that was the most stable one, not counting PC. Um, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, Terraria. <laughs> right, Stadia messed up. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, yes, it's just there. Yes, uh, it's Google not looking good for Google Stadia. Not at all. Um, what else do we got? We got oh this Pico one, this Pico story. I saw this, yeah, this unfolding. I... I saw this unfolding on Twitter. Um, so I don't know what this website is. This is like the only website I could find like a, like a good, concise, like article about it. Explica.co. So anyway, here, I'll just try to sum it up. Um, Pico Interactive is making, uh, 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 they're re they're porting Glover 64 <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> they like purchased the rights to the ROM or something and they're trying to port it. Um, for some reason, game preservationists hate Pico Interactive um, because they bought the license and they're kind of like not letting anybody else have it. They're like being really uh, litigious about about the the port that they have. Um, anyway, this article says the video game industry grew so fast that it was inevitable that attention was paid to different sections, such as the legal situation of IP and what would happen over time and the initiatives that seek to preserve this part of the history of entertainment electronics. 
as the years go by, research and preservation uh, projects find more and more material, but sometimes they collide head on with the legal wall, giving rise to conflicts of all kinds. The most recent had to do with the 1998 platform game Glover in its version of Nintendo 64. Uh, the preservation and possession of rights are growing conflict in gaming. The Forest of Illusion Preservation Initiative long ago released a ROM of a prototype of Glover, a platformer that debuted on the Nintendo 64 and also had versions for Windows and PlayStation. So Forest of Illusion is this Twitter account. It's great. They do a lot of great uh, like like uh, archiving of stuff. Oh, look, they, they tweeted. Uh, they retweeted Retro Future. Um, it's a great Twitter account. They do good stuff. Um, this game was developed by Interactive... Uh, oh, wait. This game was developed by Interactive Studios and published by Hasbro Interactive, but it passed without pain or glory, and its mark was covered with the passage of time. After finding the code for the prototype, Force of Illusion made the information found public along with the nonprofit ROM. And as part of the research and preservation project, however, Pico Interactive, the company that brought Glo that bought Glover's rights, threatened the members of this initiative with suing them and the controversy controversy with the community ignited after requesting that the information be downloaded from the internet as well as the prototype i feel like i'm having a stroke reading this um oh so this is for the windows and playstation version of the game that was unreleased that i didn't know uh, Force of Illusion tweeted, last update on this, Pico has checked the ROM I released and the data contains several differences to the build he has, meaning Pico. There was a misunderstanding and they had thought I had released their build. He has also agreed to not pursue legal action against me and we have made peace. So that's the final thing. After this whole long diatribe that he had where they were, Force of Illusion was, was just ripping on this Pico interactive guy. <laughs> It actually looks like there's one more update that was earlier today. Oh. Uh, just really simple. Uh, looks like Pico is saying that in good faith, they're going to, uh, in an effort of good faith and in the name of video game preservation, here is the earliest Glover N64 build. This is on developer backup, stating February 5th, 1998. Please point to this link if you plan to distribute it. Uh, with Force of Illusion retweeting it, saying this is the kind of thing I hope to see more of. Wow, that's actually great. So a good thing came of this. Yeah. Especially if it's, it sounds like it started with a misunderstanding, which sucks, but looks like so, it got resolved. So this is the first tweet that I saw. This is Simon Time that says, Pico Interactive is the worst kind of scum. <laughs> Destroying <laughs> video game preservation with every IP they get their hands onto and ultimately never release, as well as send legal threats to those who dump and release prototype ROMs of games they claim to have bought the rights to. So wait, so they, they released, well, let's just freaking download it. What is this for? Is, is this, so this, is this an N64 ROM or build? I believe so. Cause they think they're basically saying, we don't care about this one. We care about the PC one. So here's, here's this one for you guys. Right. Pico was tweeting an argument to Forest of Illusions saying like, uh, um, leaking something like this is a big deal to them because it, it, uh, uh, ruins the credibility of their switch releases and stuff like they wanted to port this to the switch and people will buy less of that if it's leaked in a rom but the argument is like the same argument with piracy like the people who pirate stuff are also the people who buy the most stuff so like yeah. somebody who pirates glover 64 is probably somebody who's really into glover 64 <laughs> so they're probably gonna buy it for switch is that's the counter argument well, it's like uh, that, and like the people who are going to pirate are going to pirate. True. Yeah. Like, they'll, they'll a lot find of times they wouldn't have bought it anyways. Yeah. Well, I I personally believe the best uh, the best uh, defense against piracy is just making the thing available in the easiest way possible. Like when when music was you know when Napster was a thing and everybody was downloading music, um, iTunes came around and it was like, oh, now I got to pay. Oh, wait, it's really easy. And then every, nobody. Just, people stopped downloading shit because it was just so easy yeah. to just freaking uh just pay for it um 
Yeah. So I don't, like I don't I, know. I, yeah, because like even on that note, like I know people who kind of swore off doing Ubisoft releases on PC because Ubisoft, like all the things they do to try and prevent piracy on PC makes it uncomfortable to use just for a regular purchaser. Like you have to log into so many things. And even then sometimes something can go wrong where it's like, oh, you can't play it. It's like, but but I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could I could see that P- piracy. A lot of a lot of piracy situations make it a pain in the ass for regular consumers. Um, I don't know how I feel about, I mean, obviously I want, uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of games preservation. Like I want to be, like, I love being able to just get a ROM of some sort of an old game. That's hard to acquire. Like being able to have play like Star Fox, uh, Star Fox two, for example, that ROM was almost complete and really easy to get for a few years. Um, the fact that Nintendo re-released it was freaking amazing. But there's a lot of games that would have been dead or like completely lost in time if it weren't for being able to just download the ROM for it somewhere. Um, but at the same time, I know that it's, you know, a piracy issue for certain things. There's still legal grounds there, which is, yeah. Because yeah. even for, for instance, um, Trials of Mana, that was a game that got an English localization for the first time what was it like two years ago i think it was released or maybe last year uh but that's a game that the main reason why there was even demand in the west is because there was a fan patch translation of the snes game you know however many years ago and people kept being like square like you should release this here this is really cool and you know it finally happened only over 20 years later <laughs> yeah <laughs> 20. It, was like, it was probably like 15 or something yeah. I, I i think a lot of these companies either aren't listening or they're just not around anymore or don't care about the license that they used to have and they just don't want to get back into video games or or whatever um so that's that's the unfortunate truth of it which i mean like 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 konami for example like there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff tied up in that i mean look look at freaking uh sonic 3 you they keep they don't re-release that that much and when they do re-release it, it doesn't have the same music because there's weird rights issues that nobody knows what the deal is with that. Um, is it? Isn't it because like Michael Jackson contributed yes. to like one of the? Yeah. It, it's it's that's one of those like everyone knows that like uh, that that's the case, but it's never been confirmed that that was the case. Um, it's like the worst kept secret, I guess you could say. Um. But yeah, like like I don't want to play like a shitty version of Sonic Three. <laughs> like I want the good one, and you can only do that if you get a ROM or you have the physical version. Um, so I don't know. I think game preservation is very important, but at the same time, I can see where. I mean, but then you got Pico over here, who's literally just doing this to turn a buck. They bought the rights to Glover just so they can re-release it to make some money on the Switch. Um, it's not like the original rights holder wanted to re-release it or something. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how I feel about the situation. It, it's just one of those things where there's like a legal answer to who's in the right, but it's not necessarily the answer that you feel happy about. Like, yes. It's just like, there's like, like you can be right, but also a jerk, yes. <laughs> you know, and that, that's kind of what this is really. Like, it, it sucks. That's the way it works. And maybe it's a good reason for why certain things need to be re-examined for how licenses and redistribution of older games and stuff can be handled. Uh, Cause again, a lot of the laws that have to do with the redistribution of older games were written when people didn't even think this would be a thing. Like no one thought this would be an issue. Yeah. You know, preservation was not on their mind back then. Uh, Christine in the chat says, look, I bought Glover once. I don't know if I want to buy it again. <laughs> is that, is that my Christine? Is that Christine? Yes. Christine? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> Uh, Edible Jim Sock says, have you seen how people got the original samples of Super Mario World's uh, OST from the Giga Leak? Sure, we can go right to that story. Yeah, that's actually on our list. Um, I love this. This is freaking awesome. Uh, this YouTuber, um, the Brickster, <laughs> he found, he got, so he got from the Giga leak, that was the big Nintendo leak that happened like a few months ago. Um, he got the original 
uh, music samples or, or, or notes or whatever. Um, and now we have uncompressed versions of Super Mario World songs. This is it with with no compression on the audio at all, besides garbage Twitch compression. But this sounds freaking amazing. And he's got most of the uh he's got most of the Super Mario World song. He's doing them like one at a time. Pause that. Uh but <laughs> His name's the Brickster, and he also did some Lego Island remasters, which I think is funny. <laughs> um, he has a Super Mario 64 one, but it's uh, not finished. So it, th there's some instruments that he couldn't find. Yeah. But it sounds this really, really freaking good. Yeah. So this is really interesting to me because I I'm always a fan of like the idea of like the intent of creation, right? Like what someone was trying to do. And there was this article I read earlier today about this whole situation from, uh, do you know who Tumelo is? Mm, yes. He, he's no, this I guy who, he's, yeah, he's this musical artist who, he got really big at one point for doing uh, like mashup albums. Like one of his biggest ones was this Chrono Trigger Jay-Z one that people loved, uh, which I think it's, I think he kind of hates that that's the one that blew up. But uh, he's known mostly for that, but he's gone on to make a lot of other music later on. And uh, he did an article today about this whole situation that it was kind of this opinion piece a little bit that I found interesting. That was about the fact that, like, he's not opposed to this happening in the sense of, like, this information getting out and people being able to hear these uncompressed versions. Like, this is a really cool thing that's happening. But he kind of takes offense at the whole stance of like, this is restoration and like, this is hearing the music how it was meant to be or something. And it's like, no, like they made it in mind for that platform and they like developed these songs within these constraints, knowing how it would sound at the end. It's kind of like uh, people talking about playing old school games through an emulator or something and just seeing the raw image now, like on a nice new screen versus on a CRT where it's like, oh no, they made it with CRTs in mind and scan lines play an important role here, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, it reminds me a lot of like pixel art versus, uh, you know, uh, scan lines and CRT screens. Um, I personally uh, love the crisp look of pixels on a nice pixel dense screen uh and i know a lot of retro game fans would much rather play it on a crt uh and i think the same thing about this like i know it's not intended to be listened to in this way but it sounds so much better well, and like, and that's the thing too, right? Again, it's not like trying to say like, this is not a cool thing. Like, this is absolutely super cool. I think he just has like a opinionated, like, especially because he himself is an artist, you know, I think it leads him to just taking the stance about like what the right way is. Like, it's all about context, you know? He's more offended of like how people are talking about it than the fact that it's a thing. Because it absolutely is cool. Like the fact that you can hear this uncompressed is awesome. Yeah, I mean... I get what he's cut where he's coming from though, because people all uh, people think that this is the way it was meant. That's the line there is this is not how it was meant to be heard. It was meant to be heard compressed and weird sounding. <laughs> it was because there were design choices specifically in the music creation to do this. Same thing with pixel art. There's if they knew that the pixels were going to be crisp, they wouldn't have made a lot of them the way that they did. Um, but. It sure does look and sound a lot prettier this way. Oh, I found it. Yes. I was, I was scrolling through my Twitter likes because I wanted to show this. Uh, this is... Uh, what is this? Final Fantasy VII. Look at how much better it looks with the... the Like, it looks like, like good resolution when it's blurred on a CRT screen. But... It's funny... I was just gonna say, I actually retweeted a, not the same one, but it was the same concept. Um, I'll, I'll DM it to you, if I can find okay. it. Is it on your Twitter? It's on my Twitter. Like recently? Yeah, like I think it was either this morning or yesterday, maybe two days ago. Oh, right here. Uh, this is Ed Benj Edwards, who says, I love the example of vintage game graphics rendered on their intended 
target a CRT versus modern pixel perfect emulation. On the CRT, they look much more depthy and almost more detailed as your brain fills in the blurred gaps. Uh, yeah. Yeah, honestly, wow, this looks way different. <laughs> yeah. The, like, at least these both still look like illustrations like the final fantasy ones but this the one on the the ones on the left look almost real exactly yeah well it's it, to be fair like i was the same as you were i was like oh yeah like i'm fine with pixel perfect whatever and then when i started getting into uh using stuff on crts again one of christine's friends is like super into collecting crts and trying to like find the best way to get a you know perfect signal out of an old system and some of that stuff it like it's just different like it doesn't feel the same you know yeah I, I I really want a PVM, one of those uh like oh yeah freaking like Sony or whatever, those like little those like little thing. You have one actually, don't you? Like at your studio or something? I did, yeah. Uh we don't have that one anymore. I'm I'm looking to get a, a replacement soon. But uh mm. yeah, like it's it's definitely different. Those things are hilarious too, because they weren't really meant for like using at home. I mean they're all meant for like broadcasting stations and as medical equipment. So they all just <laughs> look terrible, but the screen is it, it's a different it just looks so much better than like I mean, what it, an old school almost. it looks like a freaking piece of like a cyberpunk or something yeah like it's a weird looking thing it's got hand they all have like handles on the sides for some reason well it's because so the the way a lot of those ones with the handles on the side would be used i don't know if you've ever seen like a movie that shows the behind the scenes of like working at a tv station or something but there'd always be like that monitoring room where there's 18 screens set up showing where it's being shown and all the different camera angles and that kind of thing the handles are there because that's how they would remove and replace units like whenever they had to like test stuff it was a purely a uh, functional design for that. like I, it was not meant to be used at your home <laughs> that's what i thought it was like maybe to roll it around or something <laughs> I'll be that too. Uh, yeah, those are expensive to get a good one of them, and they're massive. Not to mention, yeah, not to mention just finding it and having it being something that could be conveniently shipped to you because they're heavy, they're kind of fragile on the inside. Like you don't want that to get rocked around too much. That's true. I, yeah. I didn't think about that. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, we got some more quickie news to go through real quick. Uh, for example, uh, Activision sued over Mara. I think I know who this character is. Mara Call of Duty. Is this like the main, the basic skin in Warzone? Yes. I knew it. I knew this was this person. Um, so yeah, it's this... This. Uh, who is this person? Alex Z Zedra. Wow, that looks exactly like, like the the character <laughs> um I'm like read the article it's a little weird uh activision is facing a new lawsuit over mara a character from call of duty modern warfare and call of duty warzone writer and photographer clayton hoggin claims that mara is based on Cade janice oh a character he created who is portrayed in live action by the same model as mara oh yeah. Alex Zedra. Oh, so then what the hell? You can get a look at the two characters in the images below. Oh, so the model isn't the one who's doing the suing. She's cool with it. She was hired by them to be the model for the character. So then what in the both fuck, cases. dude? Yeah. A press the release provided by Potts Law Firm, who are representing Hagen, says that he created Cade Janice as part of a story treatment to, to draw interest from various movie production companies, along with a photo shoot of Zedra portraying the character. The release says Hagen posted these details and images on his website to attract attention, though he no longer appears to have an active website. The images appear on his Instagram account, though these ports don't include the these posts don't include a name or details about the character. The Call of Duty character Mara was released a few years later in December of 2019 as part of Modern Warfare Season 1. Model Alex Zedra provided the likeness for the character model as well as modeling in live action uh prom promotional imagery of the character mara has since been real uh released in call of duty mobile and warzone uh yeah so it's just the same person i mean like 
yeah, this looks this, so okay. So this was what I was looking at. That I was like, that looks just like her. That's because that is. <laughs> This is based off of the Call of Duty version. And this is really just the same because it's the same girl and she has a gun. Yeah. No, and like if you read, I think somewhere else in the article, they basically talk about how the dude's alleging that, like, oh, he saw like that Activision saw that he made this character and they wanted to rip it off, so they hired the same actress. And it's like, first off, that gets a very conspiracy theory level of like them wanting to take your stuff. But two, even then, what's actually the legal problem here? Like she owns her own likeness yeah like she but, her right like unless he like had some deal with her to where no one can use you in portrayals or something else again but but i've seen this person before and her whole thing is that she is like a gun enthusiast so like the <laughs> fact that you had the idea to just take this model and give her a gun that's not you should have no legal ground there <laughs> you didn't create anything revolutionary yeah, and, and even if you wanted to argue that, like, the clothes are similar and she's using the same hairstyle or something, it's, like, that's just the standard, like, tactical look for people. Like, that's the outfit. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you really, know? it's really not even, though. I did, like, yeah. you... They're yeah, not similar. Yeah, they're really yeah, not. They're, yeah. I, I wanted to like, see... Hair when was this posted? The the, the one that uh, Clayton did. When was this? 131 weeks ago was that two years she's been doing this stuff for longer than that and i think she streams on twitch too it's like two and a half years yeah yeah she's been doing this forever yeah hey look at this one it, she's got uh, blood all over her like what is is, uh, is call of duty gonna sue her now this is yeah. stupid this is very I, for a for a second i was like oh yeah i've seen that person i thought it was like a like a uh Last of Us basically stealing the likeness of uh, that uh, person. What's her? What was his yeah. name? Elliot something. Yeah, I forget last name right now. I don't know. But yes. Page. Page, yes. Elliot Page. Yeah. So that holds because that was because yeah, everybody was like, oh, Elliot Page is, is in The Last of Us. And then uh, and it's like, no, that's a different person. They just stole the well, face it was it was extra confusing at the time because elliot page was going to be the likeness and body capture for beyond two souls which was coming yes, out around that's what time. it was that's what it was so and that, made was it, like, <laughs> that made it extra Super. annoying for them because they were like i have a game coming out this is stupid that i'm that people think i'm in this one like that was grounds for suing but i don't think anything ever actually happened there they just changed the model and moved on yeah yeah it's true um anyway uh next news we got someone actually hit every target in super smash bros melee credits i didn't know this was a thing that nobody ever did um so at the end of smash brothers melee specifically there's like a there's like a credit sequence and you shoot all of the names and this dude hit every single one it is like impossible if you try to play it yourself to try to hit every name and this dude did it things where i saw the article uh before us doing the show just i had seen this before and i was like oh i don't remember what this is like it's like was it really that hard I, i've been meaning to boot it up just to try it and be like oh no it's like, first hand remember i re i rem i used to love playing the uh, uh the campaign of smash brothers mm -hmm. like i would Arcade. play with all the different yeah i'd love playing it with all the different characters um but yeah, that, that was the worst because it felt like an impossible task. Um, but this YouTuber, Porky Zarate, he did it. Yay. Uh, what else do we have here? Prince of Persia is delayed indefinitely. I don't think we need to read that. <laughs> yeah, like we, I know what's happening there. <laughs> and uh, WB Games, Nemesis System, they're patenting the Nemesis System. Do you remember the Nemesis system? I do remember it. This I mean, is I weird. I haven't played any, uh, like, I mean, I played the original uh, Shadow of Mordor, um, but I didn't play anything else since then. And it, it was like a unique system, but uh, I didn't yeah. think it warranted a patent. Well, what's weird about this too is that it already has been kind of lightly reused since then. So I'm curious what that means for those situations because um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey uses pretty much that system. I haven't read like what the specifics are for like what aspects can't be copied, uh, 
but Odyssey has this whole like mercenary tier list thing you can work through and it's totally the same concept like character personas that have specific weaknesses you can find them and track them down they can come after you like it's the same basic idea like a little different but it's basically the same thing um the patent filed as nemesis characters nemesis forts social vendettas and followers in computer games effectively codifies the functions of monolith's nemesis system and the sum of its parts as the property of warner brothers while the language in the application is fairly obtuse as most patents claim as most patent claims tend to be the quote short version is that the patent covers a system featuring procedurally generated npcs that exist in a hierarchy and interact with and will remember the actions of players okay so this is like very specifically the nemesis system have their appearance behavior altered by players and whose place in that hierarchy can change and affect the position of other npcs in said hierarchy and yes that's the simplified version and then they have like a little graph and stuff interesting yeah so the odyssey situation is weird because odyssey does like 60 percent of that they don't remember you like that whole aspect isn't brought over but the whole hierarchy aspect the affecting their hierarchy the like them i think there are randomized ones i think some of them are pre-designed but there's a lot of random ones too so that's, that's the weird. thing. The thing that stuck out to me was followers in computer games because that's like you know like Mister X and stuff like that. Um, like he follows you in Resident Evil, but yeah, it sounds like it's all of these things together that makes it the Nemesis system. Uh, right. I feel like yeah. I feel like uh, this is like really specific for uh, for this to affect other games. Really. Yeah, I think the real like freak out for a lot of people isn't necessarily like oh i'm never gonna see the nemesis system in something made by capcom ah it's <laughs> like if if they can patent that like what's what's the next line right like it's the whole slippery slope fear which i don't know how valid it is in this situation like i haven't read the specifics on like whether this has been done before and to what extent but like i think that's the main thing that gets people to freak out about this news is like well if they're gonna patent this what's stopping whatever Fortnite from patenting uh doing a, a battle royale style game or whatever you know yeah uh that <laughs> battle royale should have been patented by somebody but it, that's a weird thing where it was like it, it was a it was a hack it was like a it was like a fan-made hack in like uh what daisy or something no no armada was made into daisy and then yeah. daisy was stolen from H by by H one Z one, and it snowballed into this whole battle royale genre. So like, this just seems really specific. Yeah. Like I don't see this as like a danger. Like 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 you said, uh, Assassin's Creed does something similar, but I don't think it's like within the legal grounds to like be sued about. Maybe Warner Brothers saw this yeah, and was like. Sure. Maybe Warner Brothers saw Assassin's Creed and was like, oh, they could be stepping on our toes. Let's make sure they don't step any further. Um, I know Arlo was freaking out. He did a whole Twitter rant about it. He didn't like it? He wasn't about it? Oh, yeah. No, he, he had multiple tweets just being like, this is... I think he was going to maybe do a video. I don't know if he ended up doing one. Uh, when yeah. did this happen? Oh, here it is. Arlo said, I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is one of the worst things to, to ever happen to gaming. Oh my god. I think he's exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> if game mechanics are patentable, you get you bet the big publishers are going to start getting really, really aggressive trying to hoard anything they can. Uh this does not this is nothing but inhibit the natural interaction. It, it, the, natu the natural iteration that built the industry. The indie space has been a bastion of freedom and creativity in the face of a rapidly degrading AAA market. Is this really the first time a, a mechanic has been patented? I'm not sure if it is. That's that's part of the reason why. Like, I feel like that's something I need to read up more on before I try to give like a more thorough opinion on this. But like, this is certainly, I think, the biggest it's been in the news for a while. Because actually, going back to the Fortnite Battle Royale example, I think didn't didn't um what's that other one that was really big right before Fortnite? uh uh oh uh, pubg player unknown 
Yeah, yeah PUBG. Didn't PUBG try suing Epic over Fortnite? Because they were like, oh, we did this first. And it's like, uh, you were a mod of a mod of a mod. I... Yeah, it's they did. And they, they got smacked down very quickly. Or they threw yeah. the case out like, really quickly. Well, because Epic has a lot of money. <laughs> yes. Uh, somebody tweeted, have you ever questioned why Bethesda games have those weird loading screens where you can rotate a game asset? It's because Namco patented the mechanic of loading screen mini games where you could play something like Pac-Man. Interesting. Oh. How, how true is that? I want to I want to find that. There's a great short video on the topic that makes you realize how much worse it is. Would recommend checking it out. I will put it in. I'll put this one tweet with the video in the document if you'd want to watch it later or something. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out because that's really interesting to me. That is, I mean, I would have expected there to be more patents. I didn't know this was like a like a revolutionary thing I, in the industry. I, I, I thought this was a seemingly innocuous like legal thing that they just do and just because they want to be able to say we have the nemesis system. I think like there are more patents. This is just the first time that I think it made major news in a long time. And I'm sure it happened a lot more in the early days, right? Like I'm sure there's patents for tons of stuff back when, you know, it was Atari and everyone figuring out games in the first place, because again, the laws weren't really fully structured to make sense for this yet. Right. Uh, but this is definitely the first time I think it's been in the news cycle for a while. And it's like bringing people's eyes to it, you know, which is the bigger part of it. Uh, GCXC said, did Sega patent the arrow on Crazy Taxi? I think they did. <laughs> I think there's a lot of cases of weird patents like that. Jim Sterling made a video about it. Oh, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I feel like I have seen a video about this of, of some kind. Anyway, that's all the news. Kevin, you need to ready your ears because oh, no. it's it's time for Twitter the week, Twitter the week, Twitter the week. It's the tweet of the week. I see. This this is this is from this is from Slaz, Slazer. It's a quote tweet. It says gun to your head. What's your last words? And Slazer wrote, "Go go gadget bulletproof head." I like that one a lot. Uh, anyway, now we talk to you guys. Uh, last week on the podcast, uh, I asked if anybody had any questions for you because I told them you were going to be on the podcast. Um, some are for you. Uh, also, if you're here now and you want to talk to us, like if, you, if, you, if you're in the chat, we're going to answer you in a few uh, minutes. If you're listening to this via a podcast service or something, you can leave us a comment on the YouTube video. Go to the YouTube video and leave a comment. And we'll answer it next week. Uh, so first up from last week, we have MX Woods 3 who says, don't know if Will is going to also be on the podcast. Nope. <laughs> With Kevin. But I'll lay my question here anyways, just in case. I have a comic book shop relatively close to me. I didn't notice before and want to go in and show support while COVID is for sure killing these businesses. I've been having trouble deciding on just... Or just on just starting out by getting trades or starting with a first issue with a couple different series and collecting over time. Which would you recommend? I will speak for Will and say that get a freaking trade. They're just so much easier to just read a trade of a comic book than it is to get a single issue. Unless there's a book you that just came out with a first issue that you want to get into. Otherwise, it's a pain in the ass to jump into a comic book series. Um, next up, we have Tyler Tattershall, who says, questions for Kevin. What make you start YouTube and your best game on Switch? Um, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but I guess also something I didn't dive into motivation-wise for me was honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> like when this whole talk happened of me possibly joining to do YouTube, it was right after I finished college. Uh, and I had a uh, bachelor's degree in English, which basically means <laughs> I did not have any job prospects outside of teaching. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to teach. I always argue it's one of those things that you can like do other jobs if you can sell yourself well. But ultimately, yeah, it's weird. So it was kind of a mixture of like, oh, that sounds fun. That sounds better than, you know, other possibilities. And so I really leaned into doing that. And again, this is when YouTube was pretty young. I mean, I was doing it in 2000. Uh, 
2010 and YouTube had just launched what 2006? Something like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to tell because was... it launched, but like nobody watched it until like seven or eight. Yeah, it was all people's home movies like for a yeah. long time for, yeah. before like enough channels started forming naturally. Um, and then as for best game on Switch, I'm so bad at favorites. Um, like my knee jerk reaction is Three Houses, and I feel like that's wrong. <laughs> that's the first <laughs> game off my head. Like I love that. I love. Oh wait, no. What am I saying? Hades. Yeah, go play Hades. Oh, okay. Do that. Oh, go yeah. play Hades. I have not played Hades. <laughs> I know, go I play know it. I, I know I should. Uh, Anthony Zombie Hunter says, love you guys. Thanks for the podcast. Also for Kevin, tell him I really enjoy his content. And my question is, what's his favorite food? Man, why is everyone asking favorites? I'm bad at favorites. Um, also food related, Christine says dinner's ready. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I, was, I messed up the rice earlier. I hope she fixed it. Uh, <laughs> I made the mistake of getting ready here while trying to make that at the same time. Uh, I'm having curry tonight. I really like curry. Mm. I am so. I haven't had it in a while. Yeah, I haven't had it in a while, but I'm also really into duck. Like I like oh. duck a lot. Like I used to. Be one, I used to be one of those guys where I'd always say like, "Oh, I like a good steak or whatever." But then I had enough good steaks where I'm like, "Oh, everyone makes it like the same, basically." It's <laughs> like, "Oh, there's a butter on it. Cool." Like I feel like duck is one of those things at nice restaurants where there's so many cool ways to use it, and it's delicious. I like a good steak, like at a steakhouse, but then I almost always feel like trash afterwards. Because <laughs> then you drink and like you have all this other food, and the, the steak is really filling, and it's like oh, not it's all worth rich. It. Everything's yeah. soaked in butter. You probably eat like three bars of butter accidentally over the course of sides. And honestly, that could be it. Yeah, it could be just the because it is. You're right. At the, at the, I mean, everywhere has butter like crazy, but yeah. specifically steakhouses, everything's just coated in butter. Um, Zonum says for Kevin, what's the best brand for a beanie? <laughs> so this is gonna sound weird. I don't really know. I don't think about it. I just buy beanies when I see them. I had a lot that were from I think it's called BioWorld. I think they do most of like the really kind of you know oh we got the rights to put this symbol on a beanie. This one's not from them. I think this was like an Etsy seller to be honest. Oh, BioWorld makes a lot of like gaming like socks and beanies and stuff. Yeah. So I've got a lot of their stuff because I try to get themed ones and not just necessarily like plain beanies. Um, for plain beanies, I don't even know, man. I just I just see one at a store and I'm like, oh, I need to get new ones. And like, this one fits. I like it. <laughs> I don't put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> you need to do a beanie count. I need to know. Like how many I have? Yeah. Like what's in your collection have, of beanies? I've lost so many. that <laughs> The total's probably crazy. I have a few that I've held onto for a long time, but I love my Gudetama one. <laughs> Ben Benjamin Isaac says, "Is Will going to be? Is Will going to get the Batman Beyond DC multiverse figures coming out this year? Ask again next week. Uh, Batman Beyond, probably. Uh, Pika Pika says, "Question for Kevin: What is your least favorite game ever? I don't even know if I can answer that. Yeah, that's such a broad thing, right? Because you remember the ones that stick, like." You can have ones you hated, but I don't know if I've ever like put real thought into like, oh, this is the one. This is the bane of my existence. Like everyone likes to like, shit on me because I say that I don't like Ocarina of Time that much, but I wouldn't say that it's my least favorite game ever. You know? Yeah, like, that's aggressive. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a cheap answer, but if you've ever played the Atari version of Pac-Man, I mean, that's just disappointment. Yes. Like just sheer disappointment because <laughs> you know what it could be <laughs> from the arcade. Uh, as far as like an actual original released game go, what, what was like a really bad experience for me? I feel like my Man. least favorite game might be one that I play all the time, you know, like where I'm like, oh, I hate this game, but it keeps drawing me back. <laughs> Here's a random one. What was it? I'm trying to remember the full name right now, because back when I was first trying to do reviews, I would just pick up like every game that had some degree of popularity, you know, to try and review it. And I think the first time I ever fully gave up and hated a game was Call of Juarez the Cartel. Like, I think I played it for like 30 minutes and I was like, this is the worst. Like, I don't even like shooters that much to begin with. They're always kind of a hit in this genre for me, but I hated this game. <laughs> I could see that, especially if you're like obligated to play it for work or something. Yeah. I mean, at the time it was still like self-inflicted, so I didn't do that one. But yeah, that was that one was rough. Final question for Bob. Will you be my Valentine? No. 
Fuck off. That's Fred. He 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 pulls the questions from last week. Now we're in the chat for a quick minute before Kevin has to go eat dinner. Uh, <laughs> uh, Edward says, Bob, definitely Nathaniel Ban Bandy on your podcast. An interview with him. He's the one who made the contest to see who can actually speed run the crack. Oh, so he's the reason why that guy beat it. I have a weird interaction with, with Nathaniel Bandy. Uh, he DM'd me on Discord and just wrote, hey. And I didn't see it because I don't look at my Discord messages. I didn't see it for a while. And then I answered back. I was like, oh, hey. And then I saw him at E3. And I was like, oh, hey, dude. And he looked at me like he's never, he has no idea who I am. And I was like, oh, I like your stuff, dude. And I, like, I, like, I totally like botched that interaction. I thought he, I thought he knew me, but he didn't. So I was like, oh, cool, dude. I'm a big fan. Goodbye. <laughs> Always such an awkward situation. I told you my story that was kind of like that, right? What? Like, I was at a... There was a, a RetroCon held nearby here that was SoCal RetroCon. And there was a bunch of other... Uh, like, uh, Wood was out here for it, and a bunch of other people. Uh, like, uh, Metal Jesus was down here. So there were a lot of people I met, and they were like, Oh, you're Kevin. You also do YouTube. I'm like, Oh, yeah. Hey, what's up? So it was, like, a very easy kind of interaction. And look, love all those guys. But the one person there who was actually, like, legitimately really excited me, because I really like his work was game historian oh so yeah after yeah. like yeah so I I've, I've interacted with all these other people who mutually recognize me and i'm riding that kind of high and i'm just like <laughs> like hey man like you know what's up and he just kind of looks at me like hey and i was like i like your stuff like it's cool all right later <laughs> <laughs> like i just you didn't just... know how to like i got so used to people like mutually recognizing right. me. i was just like oh nope okay oh Ouch. oh wait back to reality <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just hit a wall. Another person that happened to be with was Wood, actually, uh, and I thought he knew who I was because I always people always say you look like Wood from Beat 'em Ups. <laughs> so I thought people were saying you look like Wolf Den, but no, he had no idea who I was. So look, he, I'm gonna be honest. I, I think he had the same thing with me because there was a moment where I was like, "Oh, hey, man, like I'm Kevin Kenson," and he like he knew the name but he didn't know the face. I think is what right. happened. <laughs> right. So I ended up taking a picture with Wood and he thought I was like a fan trying to take a picture with him. But really, I was just doing it because I thought it'd be <laughs> good to post on Twitter. And then we were on the Spawn cast together and he's like, oh, good to finally meet you. And I was like, we met before. You've big timed me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, where are we at? Get a oyster asked ask if she can have some of my fancy hipster coffee. Sure. Come on. Come 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 on down. fancy hipster coffee do you ship I'm, I'm i'm trying to think of like a way to do that that the problem is i so i normally always make lattes but sometimes i'll get a coffee or i'll get like gifted a coffee or something that just doesn't latte well yeah it's not good for espresso or it just tastes like garbage so i will make that into cold brew and try to like add stuff to like make it better and it ended up good with this like barrel aged coffee because it did not espresso well at all it tastes it, imagine a latte that tastes like whiskey like it just doesn't i mean i've actually ordered something like that before but yes imagine how <laughs> bad that would be i don't <laughs> do you remember what drinks we had at that uh pinball bar oh. thing oh, oh. Oh, I no, would I love do remember to try to make it. It was a weird coffee whiskey thing. Oh, wait. Was there something else we had? Because I just remember the Toki highballs. People were buying you that because that was your favorite drink. And yeah. you got, you got like, like blasted off your ass on that. But I yeah. specifically got this coffee thing that was awesome. But I don't remember anything about it. I mean, maybe their menu's still online so we can like look it up. What was I mean, they're not going to tell you the exact mix, but you can get an idea. What was the name of the place? Seven something. There's only so many arcade bars in LA. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot pinball. now. But I feel like I have... Was it 82? It was, it was 82. 82. Okay. Well, I'll look that up. 82 yeah, we'll <laughs> drink menu. Anyway, Chris BX says, you should try a Spanish coffee. They're very good. Chris BX is a bartender. Uh, tell me good whiskey coffee drinks, and we'll figure that out. Oh, I think, is that what a Spanish coffee is? Uh, 
espresso martini people are telling me no that's not what it was but i have had that and that's that is good spanish coffee is a thing it's with uh at least this random recipe i'm finding which could be wrong is a uh, triple sec whipped cream hot coffee some other stuff coffee liqueur yeah okay okay that could be a thing that's a lot of ingredients you know i like like two or three <laughs> keep it simple um oh he's saying jameson demer uh, sugar whipped yeah, heavy this, this cream really on top. I, I like i like chris bx's uh i like his ingredients list oh wait is that for that that might be for irish coffee anyway yeah. um man of steel says have either of you tried balan wonderland demo uh and thoughts on if it's redeemable oh my god dude people hate this demo yeah i have not played it i've just seen everyone else's takes of being really really angry yeah i haven't played i've only seen the footage i want to play it i i want to know why people think it's so bad it doesn't look that bad from the from the footage other than yeah. it's like weird it's like weird seeing yeah. like the cgi characters dance and stuff right well and part of the reason why i haven't tried it yet to be honest is that like i think isn't part of the hope for it that it was like going to be kind of a new nights into dreams kind of deal and i don't have nostalgia for that so mm -hmm. i just didn't like it just didn't radiate with me right away but well, it, i so probably should check out if people hate it it's two of the designers for nights into dreams and sonic so like i'm getting mm -hmm. like 3d platformer sonic vibes from it it's kind of right. reminding me of like uh um i don't know like like ukulele mm -hmm. but if if the characters were designed like sonic and knights right uh, that's what i would hope from it but i don't know i haven't played the demo myself so I've heard nothing but awful things. I haven't seen a single, like, I haven't even seen, like, a it's okay take. Like, everyone's just like, this is the worst. <laughs> I will not buy it. Schnauzer asks if Kevin has tried Blue Fire. That's a game that came out for the Switch recently. I haven't yet. It's on my to-do list. I actually did mean to play it this weekend, and then I got sidetracked with some other stuff. Um, but I saw Bob's take on it, which is beautiful. <laughs> uh, I legitimately <laughs> did not. Play. Okay, so here's a little tip for you when you go to play it. Uh, the... There's little statues where you can buy emotes. So like the D-pad is like the emote button. And there's little statues where you could buy those emotes. Those statues are the save points. So you buy an emote to save the game, which the game doesn't tell you. So that's a okay. little important little tidbit for you where you actually go to play the game. Maybe it won't be as frustrating for you as it was for me. <laughs> I'm going to like extra keep my eyes out for anything in the game that points you in that direction just so I can screen cap it and send to you. I would love to see that because I saw no <laughs> indication. But also, I don't read when I play games. I just <laughs> expect the game to just point, just push me in the right direction. Anyway, I think we're I think we're good here. I think we're all yeah. we're all caught up. We're all done. We're a little past two hours and you got food to eat. I also have food to eat. It's, I'm freaking starving. Yeah, me too. I've been really eating today. Kevin, thanks for being here and taking time out to be on this yeah. podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. I'd totally be down to do it again. Awesome. Uh, we might have some things going on for, remember when we did Among Us? We might have a new thing in the works here. I, I, I'm in the same chat. I know what you're talking about. It's not entirely my speed, but like, I'm still kind of down just to check yeah. it out. So, well, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, we'll, you'll, we'll know more in a few days. Yeah. Anyway, my people, your people, it's a whole thing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Kevin Kenson. Uh, everybody knows who you are. I, didn't, I don't have to say that. Um, <laughs> I don't know about everyone, but <laughs> guys, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week for the Wolf Den podcast. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the Wolf Den podcast YouTube channel, and also uh, we're on every podcast service on the planet. And if we're not, go, go tweet at Will and tell him to put us on whatever podcast service you want us on. Um, I stream on Twitch all the time. I'll see you Thursday for a stream. It's probably going to be Bowser's Fury. Uh, in the meantime, goodbye. Later. Where, where's the buy button? Here we go. <laughs>